Evet. Bismillah, elhamdülillah, salat ve selam ala Resulillah. Lillahi Teala, for the sake of Allah Azza ve Jal. We're still going in the explanation of the book. And we talked about, remember we talked about the blasphemous sayings with the tongue. And we said that among the three types of blasphemy that occurs, uh, we said that it's uh, blasphemy that occurs with beliefs in the heart. We said blasphemy that occurs with actions of the body and sayings with the tongue. And as far as sayings of the tongue, it's the most numerous. And we gave different examples of uh, of some of those things so that one would stay away from it. And um, now we're going to talk about the exceptions to the blasphemous sayings. There's, uh, w with the conditions provided a person uh, f fulfill those conditions, then th these things would be exceptions. The person would not fall into blasphemy by uttering that blasphemous thing as, along with his conditions. So, the general rule is that the one who utters blasphemous, a blasphemous statement blasphemes. But there are exceptions. The author said, there are cases in which if one utters a blasphemous statement, one is not judged as a kafir. One, one of them is a slip of the tongue. You want to say one thing, your intention is to say one thing, and something comes out not what you wanted to say. And that's called a slip of the tongue. Uh, and if this statement that he said was a blasphemous statement, uh, he would not be held accountable, he would not be sinful for what he said. He would not fall into blasphemy, he would not be sinful at all. So the explanation, sometimes when one wants to say a statement, he makes a mistake and he says other than what he intended to say. This is called a slip of the tongue. So he might utter without his intention a blasphemous statement. He or she is not judged as a kafir in this case. For example, one intended to say, I am not a non-Muslim. And instead he says, I am not a Muslim. Uh, this is a slip of the tongue. And this is not uh, kufr. Uh, this... This case was discussed in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the book Riyadh al-Salihin that a man who was traveling alone in the desert <clears throat> imagine in the old days when you traveled in the desert you're going through areas it's not like here you have rest stops and then you have water there and you uh, counted on your what do you call the things that you take your provision, uh, your provisions that you took with you, your food and your water. And sometimes you would put the food in the water, your provisions on, on an animal, a camel, for example. And you'd be riding. This man was riding alone. And um, he had all his provisions, his food and water on that, ca on that animal. And the animal suddenly got lost from him. He didn't know where his animal was. So he sat down, very sad, uh, waiting to die. Because in the desert he don't have uh, the proper uh, tool to cross the desert. Most likely you're going to die. Uh, so this man was uh, just sitting there, waiting to die. And suddenly his animal... He turned around and his animal was right there. And he became very happy. And he was so happy, he wanted to say, Oh Allah, you are, you are my Lord and I am your slave. And because of his happiness, he said, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my slave. And this was a slip of the tongue.
This was mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is not blasphemy. A person might be giving the khutbah and instead of saying uh, one thing, he says something else. He's not going to be held accountable for that. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Sometimes when the person is writing, he can make a similar mistake. Slip of the pen. It's happened to me. I wanted to say one thing. Later on I looked. I said, what happened? I didn't want to say that. Uh, Something was overlooked. Something was missed. Uh, After you read back what you... It's a good idea to double check what you wrote. Because you sometimes intend to write something. And you thought that you wrote it. But when you look back, it's not there. Maybe the sentence of negation. If you forgot the negation or the affirmation or... Uh, or the like. It, 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 it happens it's similar to the slip of the tongue. You intended to write something, and when you looked, you didn't write what you intended. And if that statement was blasphemous, that's also excuse. It falls under the uh, excuses that we mentioned. He's not judged as a blasphemer, and he's not sinful. The author said, Another case is where one loses one's mind. The explanation. The one who loses his mind, who becomes insane, is not accountable while he's in that situation. This is why if he says a blasphemous statement in that state, he does not commit kufr by that. While he's in that situation, So, keep in mind, when we say insane, we're saying insane in some people that are like that. Remember we talked about certain awliya that gets to a certain level and uh, their heart is overflowed with the love of the Prophet and his messenger to the point where they lose their mind. They're not crazy. But uh, they are, uh, they don't know what they're doing. Some of those awliya, some of them they become like that. And uh, the person could be, he could be, uh, uh, I heard about one, he cannot remember anyone of his family who they are. He lives out in the street, you see him, he's wearing clothes. Except the Qur'an. He, the, the Qur'an, he can just recite beautifully. But he doesn't know his family members, he doesn't know his friends, he doesn't know, he can't remember any of them. And uh, he's not always in the, in the state. Uh, in the state in the, of having his faculties, awareness. He doesn't, so people like that sometimes, they don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're doing. Um, So when we said insanity, it includes those people, although they're not insane, but their judgment is like an insane person because they could say something or do something which they don't know what they're doing. They're not doing it voluntarily. They have no control uh, over that. So So the insane person... Who, the one who loses his mind, obviously he's not accountable in that situation. This is why if he says a blasphemous statement, he's not uh, judged as a kafir. Uh, this does not mean that if one becomes very angry, that he's excused. Let's say a person became very angry, or very, very, very angry. It does not mean that now, if he says something which is blasphemous, that he's excused for that. Then what's the meaning of patience? If you get, if you get angry, and then you say whatever you want. And we don't accept that in, even in worldly matters. 
if somebody got very angry at you and did harmful things to you, person wouldn't say, well, you know, he's a, he, he got angry. If he got angry and he took your belongings. If he got angry and he, <laughs> he did other things. You don't, the person in this, in our worldly matters, they don't say, oh, well, you know, that's an excuse. So, religiously, so, religiously it's not an excuse, the one who got angry. Now, let's say, so there's a difference between insanity and anger. As long as the person knows what he is doing, he's still sane, he has a sanity, whatever he utters, the angels write it down. He's accountable for it. On the other hand, in some rare, it doesn't usually happen like this. But if it happens to the point where the person becomes, he becomes angry to the point of insanity, he loses his sanity, then it falls under this rule because we said he's not sane at that moment. Usually that's not the case. Usually the person who gets angry, he's does, he's not, he does not become insane. He knows what he's doing, he knows what he's saying. So that's not the case. But if it happens to the point where he becomes insane, doesn't know what he's saying anymore, doesn't know what he's doing anymore, then uh, he would not be accountable at that moment. And as we said, most people, that's not their situation. They know what they're saying, they know what they're doing, they're not insane. They have their faculties, their consciousness and awareness. Anger is not an excuse. Being angry is not an excuse for kufr al-qawli, the blasphemous utterings or sayings with the tongue. If one becomes angry and kills another, is that an excuse? If he got angry and he cut the hands of someone else, is his anger an excuse? Do we say, oh, okay, you, you cut his hand off, but you were angry. We don't say that. Of course not. Uh, so if he commits a sin that are less severe than kufr, than blasphemy, the religion does not give him an excuse. What about the, the blasphemous sayings? Certainly he doesn't have an excuse. If the man, he got angry, and he divorced his wife three times, in front of everybody, so the wife took him, takes his, her previous husband to the, to the court saying, he divorced me and here are the witnesses. And the people testified, yes, he said, you're no longer my wife, I divorced you and, uh, three times. So uh, the, the, the judge doesn't say, but were you angry? And the, the man would say, yes, I was angry, judge. He said, oh, okay. Then he, you're, in a, you're excused. Is not acceptable in our religion in this case. So if that's the case in the issues of divorce, in the, in the cases of killing and stealing and these things, it's certainly not acceptable with the blasphemous sayings. The author said, the third case is the one who was forced, compelled to say a blasphemous statement was one heart is firm on belief. He does not like what he is forced to say. He hates it. Then he is not judged as a kafir, as mentioned in the 106th ayah of Surah An-Nahl. مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقْ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Which means the one who utters kufr after being a believer will be tortured severely by Allah. Meaning, in here, if he died as a kafir, Allah will torture him severely. Except the one who utters it with uh, 
out of being forced compulsion while his heart is firm on belief. That's the meaning of that verse. The explanation. The one who's forced. Okay. This thing, al-ikrah in Arabic, is you being forced to do something. This ikrah comes in the issues of blasphemous sayings, and it comes to issues that are not blasphemy. When it comes to issues of blasphemous, blasphemy, it has uh, one definition or, or case, that's one case. In the case of other things, it has another. So this being forced is less. The threat is a more wider range of threats are considered threats for him to be excused. As for blasphemy, the threat is much more severe. It has to be much more the threat of killing in order for it to be an excuse. So keep that in mind as we give the explanation. So the explanation, the one who's forced, al-ikrah, threatened, compelled, to say a blasphemous statement, so he says that specific blasphemous statement, not more than that, so if he's forced to say one statement of blasphemy, he said that one statement of blasphemy, not more than that. He doesn't say other blasphemous statements while his heart is on belief, um, hating this blasphemy in his heart that he's forced to say, he is not judged as a kafir. And this is the verse that we said shows that. If he refuses to say it, so a person was trying to compel another to uh, force someone to commit blasphemy. And this one, he refused. And as a result, he killed him. So the one who got killed, the Muslim who got killed, uh, is a shaheed. And this has a higher status, a higher rank, and this is actually better to do. If a person does not, there's no sin on him, he can do it, and uh, he would not be sinful, and he would not be a, an apostate. So, the condition is to hate this kufr in his heart, not to accept it. If he is forced to say a blasphemous statement, and while he's saying it, so now let's Look, think of this example. The person is being forced to commit kufr. But as this person is saying it, he agrees with that blasphemous statement at that moment. He accepts it, he likes it. Then still he's, he commits kufr, even though he was being threatened to be killed. Because now he liked it. He accepted it, he agreed with it. Uh, so he still blasphemes. Assalamu alaikum. So, the case is not like the person had, uh, he's not under threat, he's not under threat of the sword or a gun to his head. He's sitting relaxed, nobody's threatening him. We do not say, this person he can utter blasphemy and then we check. Were you, did, you, did you feel happy? Did you agree with that blasphemous thing you said? No. This is for the, for the person, do you check? Did his heart, did you agree with what you said? Did you like what you said? When he's being threatened to be killed, for example, under the sword, under the, the gun, and he knows that the one who's threatening, he can carry out, and I can't do anything about it. He knows that he can fulfill what he's threatening, and he cannot, there's no way for him to avoid it. So in this case, Still, he's, uh, uh, he's asked, uh, or he checks, his heart must not be in agreement with what, he, what we just said. He must not like it, he must hate it. If at that moment that he said it, he liked it, he agreed the blasphemy, agreed with it, of course he would commit blasphemy. Some people, they 
misunderstand and misinterpret this whole thing. So a person who has no threat under being forced, he says ugly statements of blasphemy, and they say, ah, did you, did you like it? Did you agree with what he said? With what you said? He says, no, I didn't like it. He said, okay, then you're safe. How, do we accept that in our worldly matters? Somebody comes and slaps you around and cusses you and all of that, and you say, wait, did you like what you did? He says, no, I didn't like it. <laughs> so okay then. We don't accept that. In, uh, in worldly matters, uh, in the religion, that case of him agreeing, liking, being delighted is for what? For the one who is being forced under the threat to be killed. And he said it. If he didn't, he hates what he, what he is being forced, so he hates it, then he's excused. But at the moment he said it, he agreed with what he said, then obviously he falls into blasphemy. That's the meaning of that verse that we, we recited earlier. Man uh, kafara billahi, the one who bless, b commits blasphemy, Allah Ta'ala will, will torture him severely if he dies as that. And then the exception is men mentioned. إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ After he was a Muslim. So, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا After the, this, this situation of ikrah, being forced to do something. إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا The one who's being forced to do it. And the forced in this matter is being threatened to be killed. We said in other issues, the, uh, the threat, the, the being forced has different judgments. But in this case, the force is being threatened to be killed. إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ And his heart is filled with belief. His, his heart is firm with belief. وَلَكِنْ um, Here is still talking about the one who is mukri. The one who's being compelled, forced. Walakin, man sharaha bil kufri, the one who becomes delighted, happy, agrees with the blasphemy, he also does not have an excuse. Fa'alayhim ghadabun min Allah. So the ghadab of Allah is on him, on the one who's, who agrees with the blasphemy and he's being threatened to be killed, and the one who says the blasphemy at other times, both of them. Allah Ta'ala will torture them severely if they die on blasphemy. So let's read. Let's read what was mentioned. The one who's forced to say a blasphemous statement, so he says that blasphemous statement, uh, not more than that, we mentioned that. Uh, and we also mentioned that it is higher rank to remain patient and you become, die as a shaheed. No question for you on the Day of Judgment. Straight to paradise and you live in paradise forever in happiness. For a few moments of, of uh, patience. Sheikh, was there an example of one of the companions that was... Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Inshallah ta'ala. When we say forced, what is meant by that? When we say forced, we mean forced by threatening to be killed. In this, in the case of uttering, in the case of blasphemy, the forced ikra is being threatened to be killed. Like, for example, the person says, "Commit, say this blasphemous statement, or I will kill you now immediately." And the Muslim knows the one who says that is a kafir, anyways. The one who says that is a kafir. Even if he was a Muslim and he says that, he becomes an apostate. The one who wants orders somebody else to commit kufr. So that kafir tells the Muslim, commit kufr or I will kill you now. And that Muslim knows that he's able to carry out his threat. He can kill him and he cannot avoid it. This is what is meant by force. Force does not mean to be threatened to have one's money taken, one's car, one's house, one's finger to be cut off, or one's ear to be cut off. 
Now some scholars, not all, but some scholars added to some other types of threats, uh, which is, for, some, for example, if somebody says, I'll cut your arm your, or your leg off and leave you here. So if you normally, what happens when you cut your leg and arm and they leave you, you're going to bleed to death. So what leads to death, it's, a, it's as if he told you, I'm going to kill you. So some scholars talked about that. Uh, if he says, I will cut your finger off, you have to be patient. You cannot uh, commit the, uh, the blasphemy. So you see how so, so, this might happen suddenly. It's best to have in your heart that you're going to be firm and not say it. Because uh, you, you, in that matter, you cannot make a mistake. If he says, I'm going to cut your finger off, and the person says blasphemy, he's not excused. And if he killed them after that, it would be a disaster for him. So that's why to have your, your heart firm that you're not going to commit blasphemy, even under threat of being killed, is better. That's better. So, so if the person says that, and the Muslim knows that he cannot avoid it, he cannot avoid his harm, he's going to be able to carry out, uh, then he would not uh, fall into blasphemy. So if somebody tells him, I'm going to take your money away, I'm going to fire you from this job, or I'm going to take, you know, uh, or I'm going to kill your parents, or your wife, or if a woman was threatened to be uh, raped, she cannot say the blasphemous statement. Or if a man was threatened that his woman would be raped, his wife, or that his parents would be killed, or someone else would be killed, uh, he does not have the option. Another type of excuse is the threat by someone who can carry out that threat for one to be beaten to death, to beaten continuously until one died. This is also an excuse, just as it happened to Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar radiallahu anhu is that great, great companion that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said about him that he has belief until his bone marrow. Ammar radiallahu anhu. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Have mercy on Ammar. Sataqtuluhu fi'atun baghiyah. An unjust group will kill him. So, he was already given the news of paradise for him, his mother, and his father, um, which we're going to mention the story. So Ammar radiallahu anhu, he was uh, among the weak, his, him and his family among the weak Muslims. The new Muslim, uh, we're talking about from the Muslims from the beginning. The early Muslims. When we say weak, what does meant to mean? means their, their clan, uh, he was not powerful. He was actually, uh, they were slaves. Ammar and his parents, Yasir and his mother Sumayya. They were slaves. They embraced Islam and the kuffar of Mecca used to torture them. They would torture the ones that did not have their clan backing them up, their tribe backing them up. They could not do that to the Prophet ﷺ and to those companions that had strong tribes and backings. But the weak ones, like Bilal al-Habashi and the Ammar and his family, they were being tortured and others. They used to get tortured. So they tortured his family continuously for a long time. The family of Ammar, his father, his mother, and himself. Uh, until it got to a point, not one day, not one time, continuously for a period of time. They got to a time where they went to Sumayya and they told Sumayya to to commit kufr, they want her to say some blasphemous statements, or else that they're going to kill her. 
after they tortured her for a long time, they threatened to kill her. And Sumaya didn't. No matter what they did, she didn't. And they killed Sumaya, a very uh, ugly uh, killing, or atro atrocious, as, atrocious as they say. Um, then she is the first martyr of this nation and the first female martyr. She was patient and the Prophet ﷺ used to pass by them and used to say to them, be patient uh, uh, to all of the, to that family, you will meet in paradise. So he gave the news to Ammar, to Yas, uh, Yasser, his, his, uh, his, uh, his father, and Sumayya that they will meet in paradise. They're amongst the people of paradise. And plus Ammar, the Prophet ﷺ said about him that Al Jannah to Tashtaqu ila Ammar. Paradise is longing for Ammar, waiting for Ammar to enter it. For Bilal, Ammar, and Ali, radiallahu anhum. So he used to pass by them and he used to order them with patience because at that time the order was not given for, for fighting. And uh, so then this is what after they killed his parents, they came to Ammar. And they told him, they threatened him to, to kill him as well, to say what they wanted him to say. And Ammar said, Ammar, he said what they said, what they ordered him to say, the blasphemous statement. And he came and told the Prophet ﷺ uh, what had happened. And the Prophet ﷺ said, when you said the statement, uh, was your heart uh, happy in agreement with, with that which you said? He said, no, O oh Messenger of Allah, it was not. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if they come back to you with the same threats, then you go back also to saying what you said. Meaning that it is permissible for you and there was no sin upon you for, for saying that thing. Although, his parents, uh, they remained patient and they became martyrs. Radiallahu anhuma. And you know that Ammar, I just mentioned to you uh, several hadith praising Ammar. Radiallahu anhu. As for Bilal, radiallahu anhu, Bilal al Habashi. Uh, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the muaddin of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam, he they used to torture him because he was also a slave. They used to take him out in Mecca. The one who's go, knows been to Mecca, he knows how hard how hard it gets, and you know, especially in the summer. They used to take him out in the noon and put him out with his with his uh, uh, upper. Uh, part bare his upper part would be bare they would make him lie down on the pebbles and put a huge rock on top of his chest and those pebbles underneath him they would be like burning coal so hot and they would tell him to say blasphemous things and Bilal radiallahu anhu he never, never said what they wanted him to say but on the contrary, he used to say "Ahadun Ahad," which, which, uh, uh, telling those mushriks, those idol worshippers, that no one is God except Allah. Allah is one; He does not have a partner. What they worship, those idols, they don't deserve to be worshipped. So this is the mass, our master Bilal radiAllahu anhu. So the excuse that we mentioned is under this. Now imagine what the companions went through, not uttering blasphemy. And nowadays you find some people who dare to cuss Allah. And then another would tell him, did you feel happy with what you said? 
And this guy says, no, I didn't feel happy. They say, okay. Those people under threat of being killed, sacrificed their lives and they wouldn't say it. This other one is sitting drinking his coffee, his orange juice or whatever. And then he says it just like that. He dares to cuss the creator or the religion. And then a third tells him, did you feel happy? Did you agree with it? He says, no, I didn't. He says, okay, you're still a Muslim. That's not the rule of Islam. Subhanallah. Uh, one time, uh, uh, my friend went to a so-called Islamic center, the guy who's giving a speech, he said, if a person cusses Allah a thousand times, he's still a believer. And he's saying it in a so-called Islamic center. So Alhamdulillah, my, my friend objected in front of everybody to what he said and refuted him, but he didn't accept. So, uh, so the excuse that we mentioned is if he was forced, but what, um, the, in this situation, being forced, al-ikrah. As for the one who is not forced, he utters blasphemy, regardless of the condition of his heart, he, the, um, does he believe in what he is uttering or not? Does he agree with it or not? Is he delighted with it or not? Was he happy with it or not? It doesn't matter. He commits blasphemy uh, because he uttered blasphemy. Because he was not f forced <coughs> under threat of being killed, for example. He is judged as a kafir. This issue was well clarified by the aforementioned verse which says, that the one who utters kufr will be tortured severely by Allah, except if he's forced to do that while his heart is steadfast with belief. As you can see, the condition to be delighted about the uttered kufr is only about the mukrih, the one who's being forced under threat of death. So the condition of al-inshirah al-sadr with blasphemy, this issue of that is pertains to that. The verse does not make an exception for other cases. The verse does not say that in cases other than the one who's being forced, you check to see if he's delighted or not. No. It's not like some people say out of ignorance that if someone utters kufr, he does, um, he does not apostatize except if he's delighted with what he says. This is not the religious rule. And some of them, they, they say the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Literally translating this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ means the good deeds are by in, the, the intentions. This statement, if you hear it, the good deeds are by the intentions. In Arabic, uh, if, if this statement is said, there's something that's called al-muqaddar. Um, there, in order to complete, for one for, to understand its 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 meaning, there's something muqaddar. Um, this muqaddar, you, if you want, you can say hidden meaning. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English. But, uh, but this hadith is not proof for what they say. They think that this hadith means if you utter something, even if it was blasphemy, they said you're not accountable for it as long as you don't believe it in your heart. They say, Depends on your intention. They say he didn't intend to, to, uh, to, uh, to blaspheme, so he doesn't blaspheme. That's not the meaning of that hadith. They misinterpret the hadith. The hadith literally means, for sure the actions are by the intentions. This alone is not complete. You have a meaning that is muqaddar, an unmentioned meaning. If I ask you, what does deeds are by intentions mean? Deeds are by intentions. That's... If you translate literally, that's what it translates to. Deeds are by intentions. What does that mean? To clarify, 
let us um, remember two matters. This hadith was said in what pertains to the good actions. The actions meant here are the good actions, the good deeds, uh, the good religious deeds. So this muqaddar meaning, the hadith means that good actions are valid with proper intentions. So it's not talking about sins. It's talking about when you do a good act. You still need to have a good intention when you're doing a good act. We're not talking about sins. So if somebody commits a sin, we don't say, ah, oh, what was your intention? Did you have a good intention or a bad intention? No. You don't check that. If somebody steals another person's stuff and he takes it to his home, and then you, you don't say, did you have a good intention for stealing or a bad intention for stealing? This hadith does not apply to sins. It's talking about the good deeds. When you do a good deed, don't you need a good intention? If you do a good deed and you're doing it to show off what happens to your good deed? You don't get any reward. So when you're doing good deed, you still have to have a valid, a proper intention. That's what the hadith is talking about. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Surely the good deeds require a proper intention. The good deeds require a valid intention for you to get the reward. So, and then also the second matter, we said two matters. One is the uh, is that this talking about the good intentions, the good deeds, uh, that the good deeds require require a good intention. The second matter is that this hadith was what was it? Why, why did the Prophet ﷺ say this hadith? You remember that all Muslims had to immigrate from Mecca to Medina. This was an obligation at that time. Allah Ta'ala ordered the Prophet والسلام, and the believers wherever they were to immigrate to Medina. So all the Muslims that lived in Mecca who were able to do so, they immigrated to Medina. Some were not able, able to do. The blasphemers, for example, wouldn't allow them. So uh, all the Muslims that were able immigrated to Medina. There was a man who was in love with a woman. Her name was Umm um Al Qais or Umm Qais. So, Umm Qais, she was a Muslim, so she um, immigrated in obedience to Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She did this great act in obedience to Allah and His Messenger. As for the man, he loved Umm Qais. He wanted to marry her. So he also went from Mecca to Medina. Now the act of walking, for example, of walking is the same. They went walking or, an, or walking or riding an animal, however they immigrated. That act is the same. But the intentions are different. He went uh, for a worldly matter to go after a woman. And maybe he got what he wanted or maybe he didn't but as far as this worship this great act of obedience he didn't get the reward the prophet sallallahu mentioned this hadith in that regards in this in regarding this case he said innama al-a'malu bin niyat the the good deeds are judged according to valid intentions wa innama li kulli imri'in ma nawa and for everyone who has his intention, what he intended for. فَمَنْ كَانَ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The one who did immigrated for the sake of Allah and his messenger in obedience to, uh, in obedience to Allah, in obedience to his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Then his hijrah, his immigration is truly in obedience to, the, uh, to Allah and his messenger Muhammad alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam. This was his intention, his good intention and he did the act, then his act was truly a good act and he will be rewarded for that. وَمَنْ كَانَ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى الدُّنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا Then the Prophet 
continued to explain. As for the one who had the intention of making, of traveling from Mecca to Medina going, but it was because of a worldly matter, because of a business, or أو امرأة ينكحها, or uh, after a woman so that he can marry her, فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه. Then his hijrah is what, one, what is what is his hijrah was what he went after. It was not إلى الله ورسوله. Not in obedience to Allah and His Messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. You see how if you take the old hadith, you understand. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ This part of the hadith, what is meant by this? Uh, but the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam explained that. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So, if you take the whole hadith, Not allowing me to snooze. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's not touch screen. <laughs> I'm doing this. <laughs> okay. Uh, you see how important it is to acquire the personal obligatory knowledge, even if one was an originally originally an Arab. Is he entitled to interpret the Quran and the Hadith because he's an Arab? Especially nowadays. Where no one, no country speaks the fusha that they spoke as a country or as, as a city. The whole people speaking like the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Doesn't exist anymore. The only way you can do that is by learning. Yes, you can learn what is called formal Arabic fusha like that time. It can be learned. It exists. Alhamdulillah, it's not a difficult matter. Uh, it takes it take some effort. But it has to be learned uh, in the proper way. You will not... The Arabs nowadays, they don't speak formal, true Arabic. They speak different uh, types of slang. Each country has their slang. It's a slang Arabic that they speak. Some of it is Arabic and some of it is not. Some of it resembles Arabic, true Arabic. So if somebody's at this age who doesn't even speak proper Arabic and he never learned the proper Arabic and he's going in and interpreting big books like Quran, Tafsir and Hadith and he's not even qualified He's not even qualified in the Arabic language, never mind the religious things. So, uh, most of the Arabs do not truly speak Arabic at this day and age. They speak, they speak different uh, dialects of slang languages or slang Arabic. And from one village, it differs with another village. So, one needs to acquire the knowledge they need to learn how to, uh, the proper Arabic. They need to learn the religious rules. They need to know what did the scholars mention it? What did the Prophet ﷺ say about this? The companions who were the most eloquent in the Arabic language, at that time, Arabic was at its utmost peak. They still used to ask the Prophet, what is the meaning of this verse? The companions used, the Prophet himself ﷺ didn't he, uh, didn't he get the religious knowledge from Jibreel? The, the Qur'an would be revealed to Jibreel. Jibreel would transmit to him what Allah revealed to him. Just thinking about that, that the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to have one that she used to transmit to him, which was Jibreel, the best of the angels. Then the Prophet والسلام, would transmit that to the companions. So the companions learned from the Prophet. Then the followers used to learn from the companions. Then the followers of the followers learned from the followers. And like that till our time, one nation conveying the religion to another nation.
clear, straightforward, without any uh, uh, ambiguity. The, the, the religion of Islam, the belief of uh, is pure, without any filth, without any... Uh, um, it's like the milk that comes out of the cow, and the, and the cow has its blood, it has its uh, filth in the body, it has its meat, but the milk comes out pure, not touching any of that. And that's the creed of Islam. So it still remains and it will remain like that till the day of judgment. Some people will have that, will be, most of the Muslims will be on that correct creed of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, if, if a person was to ask a pers- uh, one of those people who wants to directly himself, he has not learned in the Arabic language or anything, somebody asked him, where did you learn? And he said, well, I read many books, I listened to many lectures, me and my colleagues, we used to get together and we used to talk about the lectures and right away you would know that this person is not knowledgeable. The, the, the rules of the religion, it comes from the mouths of scholars to the ears of those who used to listen to them. And like that throughout the ages. Also, some ignorant people recite a verse of the Qur'an, the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Ta'ala said, لَا يُؤَاخِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ بِاللَّغْوِ فِي أَيْمَانِكُمْ They say, based on this verse, that you can say, if you, uh, as long as you uh, have a good intention, you're not, then it's okay. Uh, they say, if you say a blasphemous statement, it's fine, because they say, uh, you're not glad with it. And they try to use this verse, which is not even talking about what they're, what they're saying at all. This verse is talking about another matter. This verse means that if you were talking, and you're not intending to swear by Allah, but your tongue slips, and you swear by Allah, by saying, Wallah, then this is not considered a valid swearing. Uh, you will uh, not be held accountable for this swearing. If someone says to you, come and visit me, and you say no, he said no, come, no, come, come, and he finally says, you're coming. He says, Wallah, I won't. If it slipped out like that, it doesn't mean later, if he goes to his house, that he has to now pay the expiation. The one who does not fulfill what he swore to, he has to pay an expiation. This person, uh, because it slipped from his, uh, his tongue, uh, would not have to pay an expiation. He can go to that person's house, and there's no expiation due on him. And there's no, obviously there's no sin. Even the other one, he, all he has to do is pay an expiation. And he wouldn't, if he wants to break that which he swore on, he can pay an expiation and he would not be sinful. So, um, this is what the verse is talking about. It's not talking about this issue at all. And this, who was this interpreted by? That verse it was interpreted by Lady Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She interpreted as such, as, as narrated by Imam Muslim in his book as Sahih. If a person does not intend to leave Islam, if a person does not intend to leave Islam, and he does not know that a blasphemous saying. Uh, takes a person out of Islam. He's ignorant. He doesn't know that a Muslim, if he says blasphemy, that he's going to go out of Islam. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know this rule. But he dares to utter blasphemy intentionally. Not a slip of the tongue, intentionally. Uh, Without him being forced to do so, then he falls into blasphemy. Even though he didn't want to come out of Islam, even though he didn't know the consequences of his action. But how dare he do that? How, 
How would he dare, for example, to say a blasphemous statement about Allah, the Prophet, the angels, the religion? He did that intentionally. So that's all that is required. If he said that intentionally, uh, um, the blasphemous statement, it was not a slip of the tongue, he was not forced, then he falls into blasphemy. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. The one who dies on Islam, his place is in paradise. Even if he's tortured for a period of time, all believers will uh, live in paradise forever. Subhanallah. May Allah Ta'ala make us die in Islam and not torture us at all. This is the case, even if he does not know the consequences of his saying, such a statement is just uh, just as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna al-abda la yatakallamu bil kalimati ma yatabayyanu fiha yahwi biha fi nari abda mima bain al-mashriq wal-maghrib." Narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, this hadith means that a person might utter a statement which he thinks harmless. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "A a a person." Is uh, a slave means a human being. He might uh, utter a statement he thinks harmless. He will fall a distance of uh, more than the east and the west because of what he what he said. So he said, if he says the statement and he. He does not. He thinks it's harmless. He cannot distinguish that this doesn't know the consequences. He doesn't know that this is blasphemy. This will take me out of Islam. He doesn't know that. But he knows what he's saying. For example, he knows that this statement contains belittling his Creator, and he dares to say it. He doesn't know the consequences, but he dares to. Say, he knows the statement contains belittling, and he dares to say that about the Creator then he, he will, if he dies with that, he doesn't, if he dies as a kafir, then he will fall a distance of what is more, between, more than east and west. And actually, how long is that distance? That's explained in another hadith, that's 70 years of falling. So if a person falls on the day of judgment from the earth, and he will fall, and one year will pass, he will fall, and another year will pass. And he keeps falling until he reaches the bottom of hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. And because of a word or a statement that he said. One word or statement that he said. How does one come back to Islam? It's easy, alhamdulillah. First he has to accept that this was blasphemy, and then say the shahadatayn. He would say, no one is God except Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Or in Arabic, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah And then he would come back to Islam. But for some people who are arrogant, they will refuse to accept it. You tell him, this is blasphemy. And due to his arrogance, he would say no. He would not accept it. Like that person that I told you. How dare he say that to cuss the Creator, they say this is not blasphemy. So due to his arrogance, that's why arrogance is very dangerous. Because due to his arrogance, he's going to refuse. Even if the person is, uh, the person is asking him to do something which is very easy to do. I can believe uh, I believe in things throughout the day. Does it take any effort? I believe you guys are sitting in front of me. It, this does not take any effort. So at the moment of dying, what will be their remorse? That the messenger, or the people who conveyed the message of the messengers to them, they were asking them to believe in something, that's it. And it, was, it's in, it makes sense, it's in conformity with what they're saying. And they didn't do it. And it was so easy. Rather, they degraded 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They degraded the religion. They 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 made fun of. They rejected. And then at that moment, imagine the remorse. They wish because they were saying that what they were asking. They would as if their their state would say what they were asking us is so easy. I wish I could go back and I would just believe, but it's too late. May Allah Taala make us die in Islam. So, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what he said is clear, and this even if he doesn't know the consequences, because in another hadith he says, "Inna al-abd la yatakallamu bi kalimati la yara biha baqsa." He doesn't know any harm to the statement, and in this one, "Ma yatabayyanu fiha." He doesn't know the consequences of what he's saying. Yahwi biha, he's gonna fall because of that statement. May Allah Taala protect us. Question and answer. Somebody asked. Remember when when we said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pack, pass by the family of Ammar and used to tell them because they were tortured for a continuous period of amount of time. He used to tell them to to be patient. We said two things. We said at that time, the Prophet ﷺ was not ordered to fight. Um, if the Prophet was ordered to fight and he was able to help them, he would not have left them. So he was not ordered to fight, and he was not able to take them out of that situation. ﷺ. Otherwise. He would have he would have helped them, for sure. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Somebody asked about that, so the Sheikh answered. And al ikrah, we mentioned this throughout the lesson. We said that being forced. One is the issues of killing, uh, the issue of blasphemy. So the ikrah, being forced, is being threatened to be killed or the like. Like for example. Uh, for somebody to be continuously beaten until you, uh, basically he says, "I'm going to beat you until you until you die." For example, uh, so that's in the issue of saying blasphemy, which which the threat is the threat is limited and it's very high. The threat, as far as other things, the threat doesn't have to go up to that. It can be up to that. It can be less for it to be considered that you are. A person who is compelled, forced to do that. Like, for example, if somebody comes to you and said, "Divorce your wife." Now, the threat can be with threatening to be killed, or it can be less than that. He says, "If you don't divorce your wife, I'm going to take your house." If the man he says the statement of divorce, or he says, "I'm going to beat you," or "I'm going to beat you," uh, I'm going to. I'm gonna do this to you. I'm gonna do this to you. The threat is less. Uh, his ex- his excuse is less. If he says that statement, his his wife is not divorced. Okay, so uh, so uh, the issue of ikrah by being forced is wider. It includes the threat of death, cu- uh, cutting. Cutting the hand, poking the eye, taking the money, jailing the person. When it comes to the issue of divorce and uh, and the like and other issues, so don't mix the two issues. If someone says, "Well," if someone says, "Well," I read in such and such a book that al ikra, this issue of being forced, is. Is a much wider thing that what you're saying. You're just you're saying only the threat of being killed. Well, you tell them that this in other issues, as far as the the what is considered to be mukri, the one who is compelled, who is forced, with the issue of blasphemy, is what we mentioned is under the threat of being killed. Somebody asked, what about if you're beating, you're being beaten, you know. Uh, How would you be patient and you're you're being beaten? Uh, the Sheikh said, if you're beaten up to a point, then you there's a point we're not going to feel anything, 
and then you're gonna faint. <laughs> May Allah Taala protect us <laughs> from the beating and from the <laughs> and first and foremost from the blasphemy. Waliyadu billah. Someone asked about the issue of rape, and that's not an excuse for the issue of uttering blasphemy. Uh, also, if somebody says, I will uh, kill your mother or your wife or your children, he cannot, he does not an excuse for them. The threat is for him, only for him, if he's being threatened to be killed. When it comes to the case of what? The uttering of uh, the issue of blasphemy. Somebody asked, what are two fingers? <laughs> Remember, we said that if he says, I'm going to cut your finger off, that's not an excuse. So in the issue of blasphemy, somebody said, what about two fingers or two ears? And the sheikh said, that's not, that's not an excuse either. He cannot say it. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. Uh, he has to remain patient. And look at what the companions did uh, to, to convey this religion. May Allah Ta'ala not put us through tests that we cannot bear. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Taha Al-Ameen. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa dhakirna ma nasina wa zidina ilma. Allahumma ja'alna min al-qa'imin al-sabirin. واشرح لنا صدورنا ونور قلوبنا واجعل القرآن الكريم ربيعا لقلوبنا ونورا لأبصارنا وأكرمنا برؤية ولقاء سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين لا إله إلا الله